Welcome to The Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We have now reached the 30th episode. This is our last, parag- last chapter in the introduction part of Synthesis of Yoga. And in the previous episode, Sri Aurobindo gave us beautiful insights into the three outstanding features of integral yoga. The first outstanding feature is, the, is that there is a free scattered workings that moves towards progressive intensity and purposeful working. And there is no fixed system with a fixed succession. That's the first feature, first outstanding feature. And this is done <clears throat> not by us. So again, we should not confuse. It is not we who do things randomly. It is the divine consciousness, higher nature, the Shakti, the Yoga Shakti works in a way that is free, scattered, random. That is the initial phase. Then it becomes progressively intense and purposeful. The second outstanding characteristic is that it respects the past evolution of the individual and utilizes the helpful elements as well as that which is obstacles and uses everything, respects everything and works accordingly, customizes according to person's requirement. Therefore, this yoga, for every every individual, there is a unique path because the divine force customizes itself to the requirement of the specific individual. The third characteristic is it uses all life, all happenings, both good and bad, painful and pleasant, most humiliating fall to most painful suffering. Everything is used by the divine Shakti as a stepping stone. And at the same time, we must be clear that is we, the little ego, is not looking for suffering in the name of yoga. It is the divine nature, the divine Shakti uses even when we experience sorrow, suffering, fall, failure. It doesn't matter what happens. She uses everything as a stepping stone to push us beyond all this. And there is always this hand of the divine helping us to progress. And ego's role is to search for that, find that wisdom and surrender to it so that it will work integrally in the lower nature. Now let's move on. An integral method. Okay, before that, we are on the 14th paragraph and uh, the link to this chapter is in the description for those who do not have the book with them. Pick up the 14th paragraph of this chapter so that we can travel together. An integral method and an integral result. Method is integral, so is the result that is integral. First, an integral realization of divine being. That's the first result. Integral realization of divine being. One can have a partial realization. It is possible to realize divine consciousness in the mind alone or in the heart alone, or in the body on its own, or in the inner being, but in not, not in the outer being. So there are many, many possibilities of divine realization. And then there is an integral realization when it is 
spread across the spectrum of the instrumental layers. So first, an integral realization of divine being. Not only a realization of the one in its indistinguishable unity. Indistinguishable unity. The Satchidananda, that which is beyond time and space, beyond manifestation, is formless. It is indistinguishable unity. It's oneness without any differentiation in it. Many traditional paths seek to arrive at that indistingu indistinguishable unity where everything is resolved, dissolved. There is a formless, vast, timeless, eternal, unchanging existence. We must realize that, but not that alone. So not only a realization of the one in its indistinguishable unity, but also in its multitude of aspects, which are also necessary to be complete knowledge of it, which are also necessary to the complete knowledge of it by the relative consciousness. There is a relative consciousness and an absolute consciousness. And in that relative consciousness is the multiplicity, the manifestation. And to have a complete knowledge of it in the manifestation is necessary. Not only a realization of unity in the self, but of unity in the infinite diversity of activities, worlds and creatures. So there is unity in the self and then there is unity in the diversity. Unity in the self is already very well known, well established as a spiritual experience. That part is well known. But unity in multiplicity, in activities, worlds and creatures, this is something still in the making. That is the purpose of evolution, to establish that unity. We are moving from small families to tribes to kingdoms to nation states and now nation states are merging to a global civilization. Human unity, but this unity cannot come by political readjustments, by economic means. It can only come by a spiritual evolution where we are establishing in the unity consciousness that embraces all in oneness, lives in oneness and embraces the diversity. So that is an integral realization what he is talking about. An integral method and an integral result. First, an integral realization of divine being. Not only a realization of the one in its indistinguishable unity, but also in its multitude of aspects, which are also necessary to the complete knowledge of it by the relative consciousness. Not only realization of unity in the self, but of unity in the infinite diversity of activities, worlds, and creatures. That diversity of activities, the divine consciousness is acting diversely. There is a tremendous diversity what a particular culture is attempting or what divine is attempting through a particular culture is almost like a specialized project in itself. In another culture, it is another aspect of the divine that is brought in. In a third culture, it is yet another aspect. The very reason why there are such big differences between East and West and North and South, this differentiation is part of the divine Leela. 
on one hand there is a one consciousness but it is expressing itself in man woman in animal in groupings in different civilizations these are all different projects of the divine and to see the divine workings in different stages of its progressive unfoldment in each context these are all necessary for the full realization Therefore, also an integral liberation. So, on one hand, there is realization of the divine being. On other side, there is an integral liberation. Liberation brings freedom. One can free oneself from the lower nature and go to the higher nature or bring the higher nature into the lower nature and experience the divine freedom in the manifest world. That's why there is an integral liberation is required. Not only the freedom born out of unbroken contact and identification of the individual being in all its parts with the divine, Sayujya Mukti, by which it can become free even in its separation, even in the duality. That is one type of liberation, Sayujya Mukti, which is even in separation, in duality, there is the contact, nearness with the divine. Freedom born out of unbroken contact and identification, there is an identification with the divine of the individual being in all parts with the divine. That is where the sayujya, there is a merging that happens of the individual in the divine consciousness by which it can become free even in its separation, even in the duality. This manifest world is a world of duality. Even in that duality, one can still feel the unbroken contact with the divine because all parts of your being are in touch with the divine. So it's not only in the mind that you feel the presence of the divine, see the presence of the divine, but you feel in the heart, you experience in the body, even when there is a sense of this duality of the play. And that is the Sayujya Mukta. The Sri Aurobindo is talking. The next one is not only the Salokya Mukti by which the whole conscious existence dwell in the same status of being as the divine in the state of Satchidananda. That is the second level of liberation. First is an unbroken contact so that you are enjoying the Leela through that unbroken contact. In the next level, what he is referring to as Salokya Mukti, in which you are becoming one with the Divine in the status of Satchidananda. That which the whole conscious existence dwell in the same status of being as the divine in a state of Satchidananda. So you are ascended into the higher nature and you are dwelling in the same status as the divine. So you are one with the divine in the higher nature. That is Salokya Mukta. Not only the Salokya Mukti by which the whole conscious existence dwells in the same status of being. In the Sayujya Mukti, it is an unbroken contact. It is not yet existing in the same status. Dwells in the same status of being as the divine in the state of Satchidananda. That is the second degree second level of liberation. Now the third, but also the acquisition of the divine nature by the transformation of this lower being 
into the human image of the divine, sadharmya mukti. That is the third level, sadharmya mukti. You, even the lower nature become like the divine. Lower nature transforms into the image of the divine. But also the acquisition of the divine nature by the transformation of this lower being into the hu human image of the divine, sadharmya mukti. And the complete and final release of all, the liberation of the consciousness from the transitory mold of the ego and its unification with the one being universal both in the world and the individual and transcendently transcendently one both in the world and beyond the universe so he's coming back to that trinity structure individual universal transcendent this is where First is individual contacting the divine and establishing the unbroken contact. Sayujya Mukti, the liberation by being in that contact. Second is ascension into the same status of the divine, Sachidananda, the transcendent state of the divine. That is Salokya Mukti. Third is that is brought into the lower nature and its transformation. That is where it becomes sadharmya mukti. The lower nature takes on the nature of the divine, not only at the individual level, but also at the universal level, where the individual mold dissolves, its ego boundaries dissolve, and the being gets universalized. Your existence becomes universalized. Even then, even when you are operating as a point, a center of action for the divine consciousness, you have, you have universalized, identified with the universal nature and bringing that higher nature into the universalized nature. That is the highest possibility Sri Aurobindo is bringing. And you can be simultaneously in all three. On one hand, transcendentally one, second, universally identified, and in the individual. So these are three poises of that identification. So <clears throat> the acquisition of the divine nature by the transformation of this lower being into the Im human image of the divine, sadharmya mukti, and the complete and final release of all, the liberation of the consciousness from the transitory mold of the ego and its unification with the one being, universal, both in the world and the individual, and transcendentally, one, both in the world and beyond all universe. So that is integral liberation, where your identification is complete at the level of individual, the level of universal, at the level of transcendent. The simultaneous existence across the spectrum of the possibilities. That is where the sadharmya mukti leads to, into the full spectrum of identification, becoming that, and through that, the immense freedom. Immense freedom in action, in enjoyment, divine action in the world, transcendentally, universally, and as an individual center in the world. By this integral realization and liberation, these are the two things, realization and liberation. The perfect harmony of the results of knowledge, love and works. 
So the triple path and all their results naturally will be coming. So by this integral realization and liberation, the perfect harmony of the results of knowledge, love and works, they come in harmony. Otherwise, you may have realization and liberation of knowledge and some aspect of love or works, but they may not be in harmony. Here it is brought together in harmony. Perfect harmony of the results of knowledge, love and works. For there is attained the complete release from ego and identification in being with the one in all and beyond all. So that's what is happening, a complete release from the ego. We start with the ego. For many people, they may even have to form the ego because they are still part of the collective ego. Then you individualize and become an individual ego. Then this ego is contacting the divine consciousness and surrendering to it. And in that process, the ego gradually dissolves. So when there is a complete release from the ego, the divine consciousness enters and you have sa lokya mukti, sa yujya mukti and sa dharmya mukti all the levels, an integral realization and liberation. That is where it leads to the identification in being with the one in all, one in all and beyond all. The whole existence is permeated by the divine and you individual Ego dissolves and identifies with that one in all and beyond all. So, for there is attained the complete release from ego and identification in being with the one in all and beyond all. But since the attaining consciousness is not limited by its attainment, we win also the unity in beatitude and the harmonized diversity in love. So all relations of the play remains possible for us even while we retain on the heights of our being the eternal oneness with the beloved. So, the attaining consciousness is not limited by the attainment. As our ego dissolves, ascends and attains that infinite consciousness and bring that into the lower nature, in that transformation, we also win the unity in beatitude and harmonized diversity in love. Harmonized diversity in love. That means entering into an infinite variety of relationship in the manifestation while retaining the highest voice. On one end of your being is transcendent. On the other hand, you are also universal. Within that universal is the individual center, which is now beyond ego. And from this center, the divine consciousness, and you can enter into relationships of all kinds in the world, in the manifest world, and its beatitude of love and delight, the play of the one with the many. That is the highest ecstasy of love one can experience. We win also the unity in beatitude and the harmonized diversity in love. 
so that all relations of the play remain possible to us, even while we retain on the heights our, of our being the eternal oneness with the Beloved. The Supreme Beloved, that oneness is there. And in this world, there is this multiplicity of relationships. That's the integral realization's unique dimension. There is this multiplicity of relationships and the beatitude of it. And by a similar wideness, being capable of a freedom in spirit that embraces life and does not depend upon withdrawal from life, we are able to become without egoism, bondage or reaction, the channel in our mind and body for a divine action poured out freely upon the world. This is the dynamic action of the divine consciousness in the world and you become the instrumental condition for that action in the world. There is no need to withdraw from the world because there is a dynamic identification, a universalized status of your being, existing at once in the transcendent, in the universal and the individual who has dissolve the ego boundaries and become universalized and entering into multiplicity of relationships and through that there is an action in the world without ego, without attachment, without reaction. If we look at our individual ego mold, that is constantly reacting to the external contacts. When that mold is dissolved, when your very being becomes universal, it is a non-reactive space. On one hand, deep within you, there is a vast foundation of stillness, immobile, calm, wideness of being, silence, pure silence pure peace, vast peace. So when we go to Sri Aurobindo's room or go to the Samadhi, we can experience that vast peace. And in the photographs we see him just sitting as if doing nothing. But in that vast peace, is the non-reactive ground of the being who is at once transcendent, universal and visible through this individual form. There is a universal action happening because your being is one with the universe. So that action is without egoism, bondage or reaction. In for the ego, for every action, there is a reaction and it gets entangled in the reaction and it gets bound in its karmic little entanglement. This being that is liberated, universalized, there is no bondage or reaction. That's where the absolute freedom of action is. The channel in our mind and body for a divine action poured out freely upon the world. So you become the channel for action in the world of the divine force. So you're not only opening to the knowledge and love, but also the divine power pouring out into the world and acting and transforming the world through that action in the world, a cosmic action. So, by a similar wideness, being capable of a freedom in spirit that embraces life and does not depend upon withdrawal from life, we are able to become, without egoism, bondage or reaction, the channel in our mind and body of, for a divine action poured out freely upon 
the world. The divine existence is of the nature, not only of freedom, but of purity, beatitude and perfection. So these are the qualities of the divine existence. Not only freedom, but also purity, beatitude and perfection. Closer we get to the divine consciousness, this is one of the very tangible experiences, a profound sense of purity, absolute purity, incorruptible purity. That's one aspect. And beatitude, all beautiful. You begin to see everything in its right place. You see the divine workings in the world. And every form, even outer appearance, are disfigurations and deformations. You see through the all beautiful, playing through the masks of the world. That's where you experience that beatitude and perfection. That's another aspect of this integral liberation where you see that everything is in its place in the best possible way. This moment is complete in itself, perfect. Yet it is an evolving world moving towards a greater and greater perfection. There is perfection of the moment and yet it is moving towards a greater perfection. And you are able to perceive the existing perfection and also see the emerging perfection, higher and more and more complex levels of perfection towards which evolution is progressively moving. So the divine existence is of the nature, not only of freedom, but of purity, beatitude and perfection. An integral purity which shall enable, on the one hand, the perfect reflection of the divine being in ourselves. An integral purity. In integral yoga, you will find this way of combining words. Integral purity, integral sincerity, integral faith. When your purity is only in the mind, other parts of being uh, are not yet fully purified. That is not an integral purity. Integral purity is when the whole spectrum of your instrumental nature and its confused workings are all purified and harmonized around divine center, like a beautiful flower. That's when there is an integral purity across the instrumental nature. And similarly, an integral sincerity can be brought in, an integral faith can be brought in to the entire spectrum. So an integral purity which shall enable, on the one hand, the perfect reflection of the divine being in ourselves. Perfect reflection, that implies the possibility of an imperfect reflection. In fact, that is the case. Everything exists in the divine, but everything is reflecting, refracting, dispersing because of its limitation, its inability to receive. So there is an imperfect reflection. It is when we bring in the integral purity, there is a perfect reflection, just like a mirror that is absolutely perfect, absolutely flat, smooth, and it reflects without any distortion. An integral purity which shall enable on the one hand, the perfect reflection of the divine being 
in ourselves. And on the other hand, the perfect outpouring of its truth and law in us. So on one hand it reflects, on the other hand it pours out. Pouring out what? Pouring out the truth and law, the divine law, the divine truth that is poured out through us. Truth and law in us in the terms of life and through the right functioning of the complex instrument. In terms of life, because there is a life in which we exist, a multiplicity of life forms and multiplicity of complex weaving of collective life in which we exist. So in terms that are appropriate to those collective surrounding life and life that is as it is formed within our, us as the individual, in terms of life and through the right functioning of the complex instrument, we are in our outer parts, is the condition of an integral liberty. So on one hand, there is a reflection and then there is an outpouring of the truth and the law. In terms of life, as it is formed in our individual molds, and it pours out into the world. And that is the condition of an integral liberty. It's not, we are not looking at a partial liberty. We are looking at an integral liberty. Not even liberty of a part or a multiple parts, but the whole being is liberated so that it can reflect the divine consciousness in its whole spectrum of the ranges and pours out its truth and law in life. That is the divine action. So an integral purity which shall enable, on the one hand, the perfect reflection of the divine being in ourselves, and on the other, the perfect outpouring of its truth and law in us. In the terms of life and through the right functioning of the complex instrument, we are in our outer parts is the condition of an integral liberty. Its result is an integral beatitude, in which there becomes possible at once the ananda of all that is in the world, seen as symbols of the divine, and the ananda of that which is not world. Its result is an integral beatitude. Beauty and delight goes together. Perfection of form is beauty. Wherever there is beauty, there is delight. And delight is the very nature of divine consciousness. And divine consciousness brings perfection into the world. And you perceive the world as symbolic representations of the divine. And you see it in the world and also beyond the world. Ananda of becoming of the divine consciousness in the world and its play. So its result is an integral beatitude in which there becomes possible at once the ananda of all that is in the world seen as symbols of the divine and the ananda of that which is not the world. The transcendent, Sachidananda, that is what is pouring in into this world and becoming this world, becoming every little form. And every form is symbolically expressing the divine Sachidananda. And it prepares the integral perfection of our humanity as a type of the divine in the conditions of the human manifestation. A type of the divine. And it prepares in the integral perfection of our humanity as a type of the divine 
in the conditions of human manifestation. Our bodily manifestation, human manifestation is a condition. Within that, a type of divine manifestation becomes possible. A perfection founded on a certain free universality of being. So this perfection is founded on a universality of being, a free universality of being, of love and joy, of play of knowledge, and of play of will in power, and will in unegoistic action. So in that universality of being, there is knowing and enjoying and acting. Love, knowledge and will all becoming absolutely free in its universalized expression, in harmony, pouring out without ego, without that limitation, pouring and pouring into the world that is around. And it prepares the integral perfection of our humanity as a type of the divine in the conditions of the human manifestation. A, perfect, a perfection founded on a certain universality of being, of love and joy, of play of knowledge, and of play of will in power, and will in un unegoistic action. This integrality also can be attained by the integral yoga. This is the perfection, integral perfection promised by integral yoga. There is a union that is at all the levels and then the pouring in of everything into the world through knowledge, through love, through will, action and universalized action and a perfection within the conditions of the human existence. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. We have one more episode to complete in this chapter. See you next week.